Hey, welcome to the channel. My name's Tyler. Your name is Pam. Panned. With There's an a M. D on the end. Today we're going to look at some tips on how to improve our line work. Tip one is line confidence. Avoid scratchy, hairy lines and searching lines. These indicate a lack of confidence or show uncertainty. Instead, we want smooth, steady lines. There are tons of ways to practice line confidence, so here's a few examples. First, draw a straight line. Now go over that same line eight times. If you go slower, you'll have more control and more accuracy, but you'll get more of a shaky line. If you go faster, you get a smoother line, but your accuracy goes down. What you really want to avoid here is getting those hairy, scratchy marks, especially at the end of the lines. Everyone has their own cadence and their own speed, so experiment with different speeds and see what works well for you. Then do that a whole bunch more. So do this for small, medium, and long lines. If you're doing this on paper, start with lines that are two inches long, and then half the page, and then a full page. You'll notice that on the longer ones especially, you're really forced to start using your elbow and your shoulder, and that's what we want. We want to start practicing the biomechanics of using our full arm. Fill a page of that if you can, and then once you've done that, do the same thing with arced lines and S lines. Another good exercise is drawing two points and then practicing drawing a line between the two. Again, this is to practice accuracy and biomechanics. And typically with this exercise, I think you can go a bit faster because it's more about making one line accurately than tracing over the same line. This exercise is really good for laying in initial lines. And then the previous exercise where you're going over the lines multiple times is better for adding line weight. You can also do the star pattern where you're drawing lines intersecting one another and every time you draw a line you want to hit that same intersection in the center. This also forces you to draw in different directions which is nice. One tip for all of this is to ghost your lines which means going through the rhythm about a millimeter off the surface of the paper or your drawing tablet and pretending to draw the line multiple times before committing. You can see an example here of ghosting from one of Proko's videos. Next are circles and ellipses. There are two philosophies here. One method is covered by Scott Robertson in his How to Draw book, and that is to essentially draw a one perfect ellipse or circle in one shot. And the way to do that is by ghosting first and then committing. This gives you a clean, confident ellipse rather than a scratchy, searching one. However, this is really hard to do if you're new to this. So it's a good goal to have eventually, but the next method I'll show you is sort of the opposite. And I think it'll help you to get to that Scott Robertson stage. So the other method I learned from Peter Hahn's dynamic sketching course, and that is to go over the same circle about six to eight times, basically the same way that we did with our lines. And you still ghost first, but then once you commit, you keep going on that same circle for about six or eight times. Now, of course, this does look like that chicken scratchy thing that we don't want from the Scott Robertson technique. So what's the difference? The difference here is our goal. With Scott's method, it's about getting a good ellipse for a final drawing. But Peter's dynamic sketching method is more about mileage and building up your biomechanics of your arm. So the reason we go over it and over it and over it is to practice drawing circles so that we build the muscle memory to do it. And then eventually we'll be able to do it like Scott Robertson. So to do this, draw a grid on a piece of paper, build out rows and each row gets taller and taller. So you've got different sizes to work with. Then start drawing circles. Again, we do ghost first. You should be able to see my cursor going before I actually make a mark. And then I go down and start making the circle. The height gives you an accuracy to hit. You want to try to hit the top and the bottom line as best you can. And then you move on to the next one. Now again, we're building that rhythm in the arm, so you don't stop between circles. You actually keep going. As soon as you're done one circle, you're ghosting the next one. So you never stop once you get going. And then every row, the circle gets bigger. So you're having to adjust and it's different in your arm. Again, drawing from your shoulder will really help with this exercise. And then you do the same thing with ellipses. Try out different degrees of ellipses. So play with the different widths. Now these look messy, so do mine. I haven't practiced this in a while, so mine look terrible. Don't beat yourself up if this doesn't go well. This is about practice and you'll get better and better at this. If you're first learning, do the line and circle exercises a lot, but you do need a refresher every once in a while. Your muscles do get rusty as you can clearly see. Tip two, tape your lines. Lines that have no taper to them look extremely mechanical and lifeless. 
You can see in this 3D export that the automated line generation looks super stiff and mechanical because there's absolutely no taper to the lines. They're all the exact same and they're all straight. Super boring. Tapered lines add flow and movement to your drawings, which give it more life and character. Again, ghosting your lines and then making contact will help get these tapers both at the beginning and the end of your lines. Tapering your lines also helps you go over the same line more than once like we saw in tip 1. If the start and end of your line is thinner and less dark than the rest, then you can more easily overlap them and there's less chance of getting those hairy scratchy lines. So if I use different colors here, you can see where my lines are overlapping thanks to my tapers. Tapering your lines also means adding line weight to certain areas of your line, which can help indicate movement or weight or lead the eye in a way that we want it to. This starts to lean into line weight, which we'll look at shortly. So later on, it'll be about different lines having different weights. But this is more about having different weights within a single line to indicate movement and action. Tip 3. CSI. CSI refers to using a combination of C lines, S lines, and straight lines. Like anything in art, using a combination of multiple things adds visual interest to your drawings. Using too much of only one type of line can make your drawings feel stiff, much like the 3D export that we saw. So if we look at the work of Dello Longfish here, who by the way, if you don't know his work, he's incredible. Go check him out. So if we look at his work, you can see that he uses a combination of these C lines around the head. There's a whole bunch of them here. And then in other areas, we've got these really nice S curves here. S curves can also sort of be described as two C curves connected, like C curve and then C curve. They're both connected into an S. And then he uses these really dynamic straight lines like this here, these ones here. Now this one here, you could potentially call an S curve. It could curve like that, but he's using more angular lines and the reason he's doing that is to add more dynamism to the action. This character is perhaps turning their head or moving forward this way. So this cloth here gets pulled out and by using straighter lines that movement becomes more intense. And then on the other side, these also are straight because the cloth is getting pushed against his head. So by using these straight lines, it shows more action and more movement. Using a combination of these different types of lines gives visual interest to your piece. Tip four, line weight. Another way to add visual interest is varying your line weight. Now this is a huge topic and there's tons of different opinions. Really, you can apply it in any way you like, but here are a few common thoughts. Overlaps. Overlaps are probably the biggest reason to add more line weight. Line weight creates more contrast, which makes the line appear closer to the viewer, much like the way atmospheric perspective works in painting. So as a general statement, lines will be thicker the closer they are to us and thinner further back. That said, the weight can vary, getting thicker where the actual overlap happens. If you outline a whole object that it's closer, it'll just flatten that part of the image. Here's an example from a Ben Eblen video where he talks about this T shape. Really it's the same thing, it's just overlaps. Silhouette. Often the outline of your object can get a little bit more weight, but you want to be careful here. Adding too much outline will flatten your image and make it look cartoony, which is fine if that's what you're going for, but if you don't want it to look cartoony, be careful with this. Again, remember to vary the weight in different areas. You don't need a thick outline everywhere. What we're really doing here is making sure that the silhouette stands out compared to the inner details because the silhouette is a more important read. So as an opposition to that, you can think of the lines that make up your inner details as being extra thin. Things like cut lines on vehicles and things like that. They help to show form sometimes, but they're not very important and will just complicate the drawing if they're made too heavy. So keep these very light. If we look at this beautiful work from Ed Lag here, you can see that these inner details in the stone don't get nearly as much attention as, say, the bottom silhouette line. And the reason for that is because their inner details, they're not nearly as important. So if we use stone as an example, what I see a lot of students doing is they'll make all of these lines just as thick as one another, and they'll have it be the same weight as something like our silhouette line here. And what that does is flattens out the whole image. You can see what Ed has done here is not only are these lines thinner, but they also taper off to nothing in a lot of areas. He's really just indicating at the material here. 
And the reason he's doing that is because the way that we read images and objects is we see what the overall form first. We read the silhouette first and things like the material and the texture are not nearly as important to us, typically. So when indicating things like material and texture in line work, it doesn't get nearly as much importance as say the overall silhouette. Focal point. As mentioned before, line weight creates more contrast, which draws our attention. Since we want our attention in our focal point, use more line weight in your focal area and leave out line weight in other areas. Think of this as a bit of a gradient with more line weight in your focal area and slowly getting less and less as it radiates outwards. Actual weight. Another thing to think about is the actual weight of an object. A way to show this is by adding more line weight to the bottom of an object. This makes it look heavy as if the line itself has drooped with gravity. This really does help to add visual weight to your drawing. Shadow. Now this video is not really about rendering, but adding more line weight to shadow areas such as grooves and folds where you would get ambient occlusion helps hint at the light direction and where shadows are. This pairs really well with the actual weight point that we just looked at since usually our light source is overhead Adding line weight to the underside of things makes it look both heavy and like it's on the shadow side. Again, you can see some of Ben's work here where he's adding more line weight to hint at ambient occlusion. Again, as an opposition to that, you can use lighter lines if the light is hitting our object or if the object itself is supposed to be physically light. So the top side of an object can get less line weight while the bottom gets more. So that's a lot to think about. So how do you balance all of these things vying for your attention and what gets what kind of line weight? I like to think of it as a game where each one of these points has a point associated with it. Maybe things like the inner details and the lightness get negative points because we said we want less weight there. So if we start thinking of this as a point system, some lines will actually get multiple points of this. It could be an overlapping shape within the focal area that has some weight to it. So it would get like three points of line weight. Whereas if a small detail line in the inside of our shape is not within the focal area, it doesn't get overlap, it doesn't get silhouette, it does get detail, which is a negative number. It doesn't get focal point if it's not in the focal point, uh, no weight, it might get lightness. So that's gonna be a very light line. From there, it just becomes a game of adding this stuff up. So with this, I'm thinking my focal area is in here somewhere. You go up these steps here and there's, and there's something here, somewhere between these two lanterns here. So this is sort of my focal area. Now I did this without line weight, and as you can see, it's sort of hard to see what's going on, but the idea is there's this like tree or root wrapping around um, a smaller stone here, but our big central area, two stones with like, there's like a, a hole in between them. And then one of the branches is wrapping around this like little lantern on this side. And then there's a smaller root over here with another lantern. But you can't really see that because there's no separation between the lines. So what we wanna do is start adding that. So if I know this is my focal area, I know that this branch here is overlapping our main shape. Then I know that this line here, the edge of my tree is probably going to get quite a lot of weight, as is my lantern because the lantern is closer to us than this rock back here. So all of that would get extra line weight, again, to make it move closer to us like atmospheric perspective, pushing the rock further away from us. So we'll take a quick look at what I actually did and then break it down a little bit. Okay, so hopefully this helps us see a little bit here. You can see this is my main focal area with sort of the hole in between the two rocks. There's a little bit of details down here, but because they are in our focal area, I still gave them a little bit of line weight. And then this root tree thing gets a fair bit because it's our main overlap. This is sort of the biggest shape that's overlapping our thing along with the lantern, right? So that's sort of like where most of the line weight goes because it's both our focal area and it's an overlap. And then of course the bottom side, if I hide this, the bottom side of this root gets more than the top because our light would probably be coming from the top down. So this has more shadow area there as well. And it's still fairly close to our focal point that I don't mind giving it a little bit more weight. And you can see that as we gradate out from this area, we get less and less line weight. Again, silhouette, I do give it a little bit of line weight around here but there's a little bit more at the bottom than there is at the top. Here I didn't give it much. I could probably give it a little bit more there actually, but because it's getting further away from my focal point, I don't care all that much. 
This line here is pretty far away from our focal point, but there is a pretty major overlap there. This stone, this stone is closer to us than the rest of it. Not by much, but a little bit. So it basically needs a little bit more weight there, but by out here on this side, it doesn't really get any line weight. So I'm gonna start AB'ing some of this stuff. You can see that up here, there's not much line weight going on. There's a little bit, but not too much. Whereas here, look at this stuff. This stuff's really far back. All of this stuff is like behind another root back here. So that's really far back. That literally don't touch it. There's no difference there at all. Same thing with this. This is just small detail-y stuff at the edge of our drawing. Doesn't matter. It doesn't get anything. It doesn't get touched at all. So you just add these things up and see what you come up with. Now again, this is personal preference, so you can give some of these things more importance if you want, and some of them less importance. It's totally up to you, but I do think that this little game point system will help you make some of these decisions. Okay, I think we'll call it there. Obviously, this list is not exhaustive by any means. There's plenty of ways to do this, so if you've got any other tips on how to improve your line work, let me know in the comments. And I did have another bonus tip, but honestly, it's a little out there and it made the video a little too long. So I've ended up making a separate video for that. It's something that I call artifacting. So if you're interested in that, check it out. I'll link it in the description and at the end of the video when that video comes out. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe and all that stuff. If you've got ideas for what you'd like to see me cover in the future, let me know in the comments. Be good to one another and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. M, 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 M